chapter 2, the fulfillment of what we have been addressing, and we'll come back to this for a few moments today, but in Peter's sermon at Pentecost, verse 15, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that ends his quotation from Joel. So we want to address some final concerns on this text today. Let's begin. Our gracious Lord, we come now and dedicate this class, this hour, into thy hands. We pray for thy presence. We pray for the help of thy spirit as we open up the word of God together and consider the issues before us. Confessing our need of him as our ultimate instructor that one that illumines and teaches us all spiritual truth. So Lord, we pray as we consider the matters before us that uh, our hearts indeed would be addressed and our minds enlightened as we consider these wondrous truths out of thy law. Bless these men as they continue their studies and their work in this course, give them insight as they work now on their book theologies, that this will be a profitable exercise for them as well. But meet with us today as we commit this time now into thy hands for thy glory, as we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, now I have your subject studies that uh, you've done. I will give those to you before uh, you leave today, and comments uh, are there, and Maybe some of those that I want to address uh, in class as well, but uh, we'll let it go for the time being. Now, you are working on your final project, all right, the book studies. Uh, this is the major project for the term. Uh, if you have any questions on the methodology, come see me. I'll say some more about that and give a sample or two uh, in our class discussions. Any questions on that before we come back here? All right, today I want to finish up our little discussion on the subject of the Holy Spirit as it's revealed, as he's revealed uh, in the Old Testament. And looking at it from a biblical theological analysis, seeking to inform our systematic theology, answering ultimately that question concerning the difference between the work of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament dispensation and the work of the Spirit of God in the New Testament dispensation. And we went through some of the material there. I'm not going to rehash everything that we looked at in terms of the uh, data from the Old Testament in terms of the different aspects of the Spirit's ministry. Uh, but I want to come back to what we were discussing at the end of our uh, time last as we were looking at Joel's prophecy, which is absolutely crucial uh, to the ultimate answering of that question as to what happened at Pentecost that marks the difference between this and the Old dispensation. 
And we have read this morning from Acts chapter 2, where we have Peter quoting virtually in toto uh, the whole third chapter uh, of the prophecy of Joel, say the third chapter from the perspective of the Hebrew text. Hebrew division of Joel was a bit different than what we have in the English Bible. Nothing has changed as far as the wording is concerned, but just the chapter division, verses 28 to 32, constitute really chapter 3 uh, in Joel's prophecy, and then what we have as chapter 3 is chapter 4, but I say that's just a matter of the division. Now, given the importance of this text, I want to uh, look again at the structure of what Joel is saying and how that applies to Pentecost to see if we can answer that question again. And just to get us started, remember we have these four different categories of the Spirit's work, regeneration, that supernatural work of the Spirit of God that implants life into the heart of the dead sinner. Then the indwelling of the Spirit, which we take as God's unceasing abiding presence uh, in the life and the heart of every believer, a gracious gift of God, constant unceasing abiding presence. Then the empowering for service, and the empowering is always service oriented. And we saw that as we went through the data uh, from the outline. Spirit of God would come upon a judge and he would judge, come upon a prophet, he would prophesy, come upon a king and he would do his kingly stuff. The empowering of the Spirit, occasional, repetitive, it was that which was always service oriented, task oriented uh, for the work of the kingdom. And uh, that, as we have seen, is the great emphasis upon uh, the Old Testament data. And then the final category, what we're calling the influence of the Spirit, uh, the obedience that we are to give uh, unto the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, not with wine, where it is excess. Now, my contention is, all right, that while all of these are obviously true from the New Testament and clear examples of each from the New Testament, that each of these are also true in the Old Testament. Uh, that Old Testament saints were regenerated. That Old Testament saints were under the influence of the Spirit as they were sanctified, walking with God. You have that imagery uh, that is being used. You have certainly the empowering, and far and away, the vast majority of the data uh, of the work of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament deals with this issue of the empowering uh, of the individual for the kingdom work, whatever that kingdom work may have been, and then the indwelling. So all of that was true, I think, in both dispensations. What is it that happened at Pentecost? If we bring this to a close, I want to uh, answer two questions. What happened at Pentecost? And then what about the indwelling of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament? Uh, is there evidence, and how was that taught? How was that experienced? How was that revealed, if you will, uh, from the biblical data? Now, there's no question that when we come to uh, Joel, and I've given to you, I've referred to this, there it goes. Uh, I've given to you the text here, if you can uh, see this, uh, from, Joel's, from Joel's prophecy. And there are really three distinct prophecies. I don't want to get into the hermeneutics right now of, of prophetic uh, discourse. Uh, some of that will come up in our discussion, I suppose. But as we look at verses 28 to 32, and what I've given to you here reflects those verses, I'm going to argue that we have three distinct prophecies. It's all in one prophetic corpus. All right? It's all in a prophetic discourse. But I'm suggesting that the structure of the text is indicating that we have three distinct predictions, if you will, three distinct prophecies within this one prophetic oracle. And a couple of things suggest that too. And I tried to reflect this here on the, 
analysis. Each of these begin with a while perfect. All right? Each of these three little paragraphs begin with the while perfect. The while perfect here is a way of expressing the future tense, and it will be, and it will happen, and I will give, and it will happen. All right? So this is a way of expressing a future tense uh, in Hebrew. And it's not without significance to me then that each of these paragraphs begin with that while perfect, a structural marker that I'm observing uh, that uh, marks these as separate paragraphs. Now, in addition to that, in addition to that, I've also, and we did refer to this, but now we can see it very dramatically, uh, that we have the use of inclusio, inclusio being that verbal parenthesis where a section begins and ends either with a similar statement or an exact statement, uh, lexically or even thematically. But this becomes very, very obvious. You can see at the beginning of uh, this first paragraph, you have the statement, I will pour out my spirit. And then at the very end of that, you have, I will pour out my spirit. The repetition of that beginning and end of that verse would tend to mark that as a separate literary unit. We come to the last. Beginning, we have the verb kara. At the end, we have the verb kara. Different form of the verb, but the same lexical item, which again, I would interpret as being uh, an example of inclusion. So there's significant evidence here to me uh, that we have three distinct, three distinct uh, prophetic utterances, each beginning with the while perfect, the first one being set off by the inclusio, the last one being set off by the inclusio. There's no inclusio in the middle one, but it doesn't take you know, a, a, a lot of acumen here to, to recognize that if this one is set off as a unit and that one is set off as a unit, uh, that what's left must be a unit as well. All right, you see what I'm saying? So I think from a structural standpoint here, we have evidence of three distinct prophetic units. Now this also fits very nicely into the, uh, let's see if I can get rid of all this mess now, into the whole uh, structure of Joel's, Joel's prophecy, the time of the blessing, time of this blessing, and there's no question that this outpouring of the Spirit of God that Joel is referring to here uh, is a most obvious blessing. Now, if you can think with me just for a moment, I can just set this up in the context, right? Part of biblical theology is exegesis. Remember, biblical theology is nothing more than uh, an aspect of our exegetical process. Context is important. All right, the context is always important. We never want to take things out of its context and run with it. We want to put it within the framework of the argument. Uh, and part of doing the book theology that you're working on is to be able to identify what the argument uh, of that book is and where things would then fit and how they would fit within the progression of that uh, particular truth, whatever it is that you may be uh, investigating. Now, when you look at Joel, remember Joel is dealing with the day of the Lord. Isaac writes you that the day of the Lord for us. You defined the day of the Lord for us last time, right? Uh, as being those, uh, those epic moments, those epic times, uh, when God interrupts the affairs uh, of time and circumstance. We have providence, all right? Providence uh, is the all-wise activity of God, whereby he rules and preserves all that he has created. I can say that providence, on the one hand, is the ordinary work of God, all right? And you understand what I mean by that. Uh, there's nothing from our perspective that God does that's ordinary. But from God's perspective, providence is the ordinary, it is the ongoing work of God. The day of the Lord is an extraordinary work. It doesn't happen all the time. Providence happens all the time. How do I know that? Because we're still here, right? As soon as providence stops, then everything falls apart holds all things by the word 
of his power. So we know that God is on his throne if we're still here looking at each other. Uh, we're being preserved. Our providence is the ongoing operation of God. But the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord are those special manifestations, those special interruptions uh, where God, as it were, lays bare his arm uh, into the affairs of time and circumstance, either for blessing or for judgment depending upon whether he's dealing with the righteous or whether he's dealing with the wicked. But it's a day of divine interruption, interference, if I can put it in those terms, into the affairs of time and circumstance. Now here's this day of the Lord. Here's this day of the Lord that Joel is uh, dealing with. It's a, it's, a, it's a locust plague, right? Joel hits it. Here, here's this locust plague. And the palmer worm and the locust have done all this stuff, and there's a devastated the land. Now, from one standpoint, from one standpoint, there was nothing unusual about locust plagues. Those bugs came and gone, and they had their own cycle of events. And from one standpoint, it wasn't unusual uh, or unexpected even to have a locust plague. But Joel looks at this, and he put in the historic context, my particular view of Joel uh, is that. It's 9th century, uh, probably about 8.30 or so, in that time of, of, of Athaliah, coming to the end of Athaliah's uh, renegade rule. Uh, her being set aside, the boy king, uh, Joash now being elevated under the leadership of Jehoiada. Reading between the lines for that, uh, you have some to put it later, but I put it in the 9th century. Uh, so if that be the case, God is coming in judgment. And I say, here's this, here's this locust plague. He says, hey, this is the day of the Lord. This locust plague is the day of the Lord. Uh, and you see his conclusion. If you go to verse 15, uh, alas for the day. Uh, the day of the Lord is at hand. And as destruction from the Almighty uh, shall it come. An interesting play upon words there, right? Uh, the word destruction is the Hebrew word shov, shov, and it's shov that comes from the Almighty. And, and what's the divine title Almighty here? You know what the divine title is? It's not here, I'm, I'm looking at the Bible. Shaddai. All right, it's Shaddai. Shaddai. So here you have shov coming from Shaddai, so it plays upon that, uh, about, upon that idea. But here's this locust play, this is a day of the Lord. And then he argues, if you think this is bad, unless you repent, it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse. There's a greater uh, devastation uh, that is coming. So he offers this great message to repent. One of the greatest uh, texts dealing with repentance. Somebody was dealing with that theme. If you're dealing with, with, with the theme of repentance, uh, conversion, uh, and you wanted to isolate what the key texts are in the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2 is at the top of the list. Top of the list. It's a remarkable statement here. Uh, turn ye unto me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn to the Lord your God, for he's gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and so forth. All right. Invitation to repent. On the basis of this devastating judgment that is come and is threatened to come even worse, you repent. You repent. Uh, and uh, that leads then to two messages, uh, really, of restoration. And there seems to be uh, there seems to be some response on the people. Look at verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for the land and pity his people. Now the authorized version translates that as a future tense here. But if you look at your Hebrew text, you'll find that that word, those verbs are actually walk consecutive in purpose. Uh, they're past tenses. They're past tenses, which indicates that the Lord at this point has demonstrated his jealousy and his compassion and his concern for the land, which presupposes some degree of repentance, which we would anticipate uh, under the leadership of uh, Jehoiada. Now that leads then to two promises. Two promises. You have the first promise of the restoration of the locust plague. It's going to send the rain. Look at verse 23. Be glad. Ye children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. He'll cause you to come down through the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. 
Notice the word month is in italics uh, in your authorized version, meaning the word is not there. At the first, all right? And you'll notice what I'm saying here then, if you look back at the uh, little outline that I have, the temporal blessing, the near prophecy, marked by Birishi. All right, that's the word that occurs here. Here's the first blessing, a temporal blessing. I was going to restore the year the locust have eaten. All right, uh, you've repented, and now here's the promise. The Lord's going to send the rain at the appropriate time. There's going to be blessing. There's going to be a restoration from the temporal perspective. And then, and then uh, at verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward. It shall come to pass afterward. After thus. Now the question is after what? All right, after what? Will this blessing come? After the first blessing. All right, after the first blessing. Uh, here now is a second stage, a spiritual and a distant prophecy. Now, the temporal prophecy, the temporal prediction here, marked by the Birashit, the restoration of the locust period, would seem to indicate that happening within the time framework of Joel's ministry. And it shall come to pass after. After that, here comes the next one. Now there's no question, there's no question when this after thoughts. When was the after thoughts? When was it? Pentecost. All right, Peter says this is that that Joel prophesied. So, a good indication here of, of, of uh, the nature of prophetic language. Some of our dispensational brethren like to uh, refer to prophecy as pre-written history, right? Pre-written history. In a sense, yeah, I understand that. But what what, what is essential for history? What do you think for history? You guys with me today? Mm -hmm. Just kind of sitting uh, well, what you, you, time? Time framework, right? Set things, dates, whatever. But if anything is missing from prophecy, uh, it's the uh, it's the focus on time, right? And and you the prophets will very often juxtapose uh, particular predictions in the same breath, in the same breath without any indication uh, as to the time gap between. Classic example of that is what in Isaiah, remember Isaiah 61? Isaiah 61, great messianic passage, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me. And on the day when the Lord Jesus entered into the synagogue at Nazareth, you see this in Luke chapter 4, he picked up the scroll, opened up the scroll, he began reading Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of God comes upon me, here I am. Messiah, right, Messiah, Messiah, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, Isaiah says, in the day of vengeance of our God. Christ reads that. Christ reads that, and he stops in the middle of the verse. He stops in the middle of the verse, I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he says, what? This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. Now, question, why did Christ not finish the verse? Why did he not finish the verse? After he spread the scroll out a little bit and then do it. <laughs> no, he knew what it was anyway, right? Sure. Because that part of the verse was not being fulfilled in that day. Right? The day of vengeance. That's the day of the Lord. That's the eschatological coming of judgment upon. That's come. But Isaiah puts the two in a single breath. He puts the two statements in a single breath without making any distinction in the time framework between the two. Characteristic, I say, of prophecy. Now, I'm saying to you that I think that's what we have here. If I'm right concerning the date of Joel, all right, that this is 8.30 or so, this is 8.30 or so, and here's this restoration from the locust plague that happened within that general time framework, how much time, how much time between verse 27 and verse 28? You've got the rest of the Old Testament history, you've got the intertestamental period, and you've got the day of Pentecost. You've got hundreds of years. You've got hundreds of years between 
those two verses. But not to worry. All right? That's not the issue. The fact of the matter is what the issue is. Here is after thus, after this blessing, then here comes this magnificent pouring out of the Spirit of God. And then there will be this demonstration of the wrath of God. And then there will be this invitation, promise to whoever calls. In that prophecy. Future delivery. We see it happening in the day of Pentecost, sir. But had that happened before? All right? Was it true in the Old Testament dispensation that those that called upon the name of the Lord would be delivered, would be saved? Sure. 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 The fact there's a prediction. We get the mindset sometimes that if it's a prediction, it's never happened before. And it, we, we don't want to interpret the future that way. All right? You don't interpret the future that means if it's good, that it's never happened before. Uh, this is. Uh, can I get personal here? Uh, when, when, when I go home tonight, when I go home tonight, I will. Embarrassing to say this, but on. Well, I go, I, I will kiss my wife. Okay? I will. Now, how do you interpret that? Do you say, come on, Eric, you've been married for 40 odd years and you've never done that before? <laughs> no. No. I've done it plenty of times, right? But, let's do it. So, this is the idea, right? I, for some reason, the only example came in my mind. Uh, I, I, those that will call upon the name of the Lord, not that nobody's ever done it before. But it's going to happen in a manifest way here. All right, you see how all of that, how all of that works. All right, now Peter's application. Now, what is involved here? All right, let's look at involved in, in this first uh, prophecy, particular. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And what's the consequence? What's the consequence of the spirit being poured out upon all flesh here? Your sons prophesying, your daughters probably old men. Whatever. They're, they're doing prophet stuff, all right? They're doing prophet stuff. They're doing kingdom work, all right? Will we agree that whatever it is that is happening here is the empowering of the Spirit, right? It's the empowering of, it's not talking about the indwelling of the Spirit here. It's not talking about regeneration here. Talk about the empowering. The Spirit of God will be poured out in this effusive way upon all flesh. All flesh. Now you want to do a study of that? Well, it's all flesh. It's all flesh. And you'll find that all flesh, as that term is used in the scripture, in the Old Testament, designates who? No big deal. All flesh. Right? <laughs> Jews and Gentiles both. All right? Jews and Gentiles both. Uh, all peoples. All peoples. And then you have the young and the old. You have those that were not typically in this day, receiving the empowering of the servants, whereby they do kingdom, kingdom work. work. Now, what happened on the day of Pentecost? What happened on the day of Pentecost? I say what happened on the day of Pentecost is exactly what the Old Testament is talking about here, what Joel is prophesying here. There they are, the upper, who's in the upper room? Exactly. The whole church, as it was at that time, right? 120. Uh, had the 12 apostles, 11. Uh, you, you had the men, the women. You had, and the Spirit of God came upon whom? Everyone. And who is it on the day of Pentecost, of those 120 in the upper room upon whom the Spirit of God came, that went out into the streets of Jerusalem preaching? Everybody. It wasn't just, wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just the apostles. It was the whole lot of them. It was the whole lot of them that are going out, and this is why it was such a mystery. We're hearing the word of God from these people coming out of our own language. Peter says, let me tell you, this is that. I love that statement. This is that which Joel prophesied. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
And what we have happening on the day of Pentecost is a massive effusion of spiritual power. Of spiritual power. Available now, not just to the leaders. The data of the Old Testament was that this empowering was particularly for the leadership. Kings and priests and prophets and judges. But the day's going to come. Joel said, the day's going to come. Peter said, it's here. It's here. And, and, and you see the interesting change that Peter makes here? Look at what Peter does. Joel says, after thus. After that. But Peter says, in the last days. In the last days. In the last days. Which is not a literal translation of the Hebrew. And it's not what the Septuagint says. The Septuagint, I give you the Septuagint here, the Septuagint says, and it will be after these things. So Peter intentionally departs from both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint text with this statement in these last days. And we know the last days refer to what? When did the last days begin? Are we waiting for them? We're in them. Beginning there at the very incarnation, this new dispensation. And then, so Peter, Peter sees his day, Peter sees his day then, uh, to be the beginning of Joel's prophecy. Not every aspect. I've got all these lines going through here. When you move the text, everything gets a little. The circle don't make any sense. Peter's deliberate change from both the Masoretic text after thus and the Septuagint, and it will be after these things. In his reference to the time of fulfillment, he saw his day as the beginning of Joel's prophecy. Not every aspect was fulfilled at Pentecost, particularly the elements of the second set awake the final day of the Lord. Pentecost began the fulfillment of Joel, but fulfillment continues in the present era, being ultimately fulfilled in the future day of the Lord. Pentecost started something. Started something. So that we have now in this age, all right, in our day, in these last days, we have the availability of the Spirit of God for every believer to be engaged in the kingdom of God. Not just preachers, all right? Not just teachers. Not just the leadership. But here is this big difference, and it is a huge difference between the Spirit's work in the Old Testament and what we have now in our day. The availability of the Spirit. And so we can, we can tell our people as we seek to motivate them to be involved in evangelism, to be involved in witnessing, to be involved in whatever aspect of their service to the Lord is. You can do it in the power of the Spirit. And that spiritual power is available as promised to you. How do we get it? How do we get the empowering of the Spirit? How do we get the empowering of the Spirit? Do I have, I, 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 how do I get regenerated? Sovereign work of God. Sovereign work of God. That's his business. The indwelling of the Spirit. How do we get that? It's a gift of God. I don't have to pray for it. I don't have to seek for it. The indwelling of God's Spirit is the constant, unceasing, abiding presence of God within a believer, his gift. Being under the influence of the Spirit. That's obedience. Paul said, command it. You just, you just obey. You have to pray with God's will to be filled with the Spirit. You just do it because we're God's a command. It's a command to be under that influence. Be empowered. How do we get the empowered? We pray for it. We pray for it. Remember in, in, in this analogy, in his, 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 his teaching on prayer, the Lord Jesus says, you know, what father? The kid asks him for, for bread. Mm -hmm. What father going to give him a stone for a scorpion? How much more? Yeah. How much more will your heavenly father not give to you what? Oh, oh, right. Right. Oh, How much more? I know is in the will of God. If I'm involved in kingdom work, if 
I'm involved in certainly in preaching. Would you not be afraid? I'd be afraid. And I hope we can get this fear in our heart. I'd be afraid to step in a pulpit without having prayed for the power of the Spirit of God. For that kingdom work of that ministry. It applies to us as ministers. It applies to us as ministers, certainly. But I say it, it's, it, it's something that we can, as it were, share with our people. And we encourage them because Pentecost made the difference. No longer, I say, just just the leadership. And uh, I, I don't want to digress here too much. But what does it feel like? What does it feel like to be empowered by the Spirit? What does it feel like? It's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. There are times when you preach. Some of you are just getting started. There are times when you preach when you're going to feel liberty. You are going to feel like every thought you have is on target, that your points of emphasis are there, you're gesturing in the right place, and everything is just kind of, And there, there, I'm telling you what, there's no better feeling for a preacher than to know that liberty. You had it yet? <laughs> <laughs> liberty. But you're not going to be long in the pulpit either before you feel like you're, I use the expression, but like you're, you're plowing concrete. Words don't come. Thoughts aren't there. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Okay, I'm not a mystic in the sense of being weird. Uh, but there have been times when I've been uh, when I've preached almost an out of body experience. I'm preaching and I sit over here and I'm saying to myself, sit down and shut up. <laughs> sit down and shut up. You're wasting. That's your own, if I'm preaching the word. And, and, and the Lord will very often, the Lord will very often remind you that it's not how you feel. That it's not how you feel. Uh, time when I felt that I was in great liberty and nothing seems to happen. And other times when I preach and I've been in total bondage, plowing concrete the whole way, and there's been conversion. What does that say to you? It's not you. It's not you. It's the Word. It's the Spirit. That's what we need. That's what we need. So let us take, let us take advantage of Pentecost right? and, and to receive this great, great gift that God has made available for us. All right. Any questions there? I understand this part of it and not disagreeing with it, but if you think back into the Old Testament, um, whether you whether you take the the Hebrews, you know, heroes of faith and look at them, many of them, many, some weren't leaders in in the sense that you've described. If you go through, you know, you have Ruth who's a woman, a Moabite test. You know, you have the Shunammite woman, you have all these positive models of regeneration, faith, which is worked by the Spirit. So I guess my question is, how does that fit into your model, or how do you deal with the exceptions? Yeah, I, I don't think those are exceptions. I would agree with you. I would take every one of those as being regenerated. Yeah. I would take every one of those as being indwelt by the Spirit of God. I would take every one of those as being uh, under the influence of the Spirit. But as far as the biblical data is concerned, I don't know that I've ever read where Ruth was 
empowered by the Spirit. The Spirit of God came upon them. I don't have that data of the Spirit of God coming mm -hmm. and empowering them for a particular ministry. There is Rahab, great example of faith, but I don't see her being in the language of Scripture, with the data being empowered, the Spirit of God clothing her. But you wouldn't deny that reality. I'm saying the emphasis, all right? I'm saying that the emphasis, the data of the Old Testament is here, it's on leadership. No. The data then of the New Testament becomes effusive, all right? And as a biblical theologian, all right, from that standpoint, I'm just dealing with the data, mm -hmm. all right? Can we then extract and, and uh, in, in infuse our systematic, yeah, you can do that. All I'm saying is that from the standpoint of the evidence that I can collect from the biblical theological discipline, I don't have that terminology being used for lately, mm -hmm. with a few odd exceptions, right? Such as Bezalel, we talked about, who is a leader, but not in a spiritual sense, except he was involved in King Court. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know that we're on different pages here. No. Uh, all I'm saying is that from the data aspect, I don't, I don't think it's there. Good. Okay. All right, now, this question. What about the indwelling? I, I, I've said that I believe that Old Testament saints were indwelled by the Spirit. Can I make that statement on the basis of systematic theology? Sure, I can. Yes. All right, I have a, uh, I, I've got a, uh, a, a presupposition, all right, in regard to the continuity uh, of Scripture, uh, in regard to the continuity of God's redemption. So from a, from a systematic theological perspective, yes. Now, from a biblical theological Look at the evidence. How would we argue for the indwelling of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament dispensation? From a biblical theological perspective. And I, I agree with all, all, all of the systematic, dogmatic conclusions. Put that within the framework. But as I now collect, so now I collect the data uh, of the Old Testament scriptures. How would I go about? How would I go about arguing for the indwelling? Any help here? Comments? Can I? Is there evidence? Is there evidence in the Old Testament of the indwelling of the Spirit, or is that simply a systematic theological conclusion, confessional conclusion? And everybody's quiet. Everybody's staring at their computer screens. What we're doing frantic searches here. <laughs> <laughs> David, David. In his confession, Psalm 51, he says, take not, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So you think David was afraid of losing the indwelling of the Spirit? I don't think so. All right. I, I would interpret that to be, again, the empowering for service as he compared now what happened to Saul. Saul was displaced from his kingly ministry uh, because of his sin. Don't take away this empowering of the Spirit from me, this anointing, putting me on the shelf or something. Right. I don't think he's talking about the indwelling. But at the same time, if, when we compare Saul's life, he had Spirit of the Lord coming on him and he prophesies he was strengthened. But uh, when, once the Spirit of the Lord left him, he was Spirit came upon Saul. Yeah. And what is the evil spirit? Here, I mean to say that there was the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in Saul's life. The, the, the empowering is repetitive. Right? Empowering is repetitive. The only one 
to whom and for whom the empowering of the Spirit was not repetitive was who? Jesus Christ. All right? The Spirit of God came upon him without measure right? and never, never left from that empowering perspective. Uh, it is repetitive. It's repetitive for Saul. So I, I, I don't know that that really is talking about the indwelling aspect at all. Yeah, that's good. What about uh, Daniel? About what? Daniel. 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 Yeah. What about it? The Spirit of God was in him. Spirit of God was in him. We can take that perhaps as the indwelling. The Spirit of God was in him. And here comes a revelation that he gives, all right? Inspiration. Inspiration, which was a particular prophetic work where the Spirit of God bore these Old Testament, all the scripture writers along. And so we can argue maybe indwelling, but probably inspiration in the sense of service there in the writing of the scriptures. Is it good? Now, when we talk about the indwelling, here's how I would talk about the indwelling. We're talking about God's constant, unceasing, abiding presence with his people. Right? For fellowship, for comfort, consolation, all of those attendant circumstances. Now, is there evidence in the Old Testament where God declared to his people, I will be with you? We can multiply that down. I will be with you. The whole Emmanuel concept. What's Emmanuel? God with us. God with us. Now, in what way was God with us? You know, I, I, I can, you, you just go to the Pentateuch. I looked at some data before I uh, came to class, a lecture that I have for Genesis, for the Pentateuch. And, and I think I have a, made a statement there, and if I had enough energy right now to back up and go behind the desk, I could be the right numbers. But I think it's over 80 times. Over 80 times in the Pentateuch for some statement that God says, I will be with you. I will be with you. I'll be with Abraham. I'll be with Isaac. I'll be with Moses. Uh, I'll be with Joshua. I'll be with Moses. I will be with you. Now, God is promising. Emmanuel, God with his people. Uh, now that's the ministry of the indwelling spirit. Yeah. All right, here's the ministry of the indwelling I will be with you. Now in what sense? When, when God said to Abraham, to Moses, I will be with you. Was, was that just theory? Or? Now sometimes there were Christophanies. All right, sometimes there were Christophanies, weren't there? angel aboard, there's a visible manifestation uh, of the presence of God, the Athenes. Uh, uh, but most of the time, no. So if God was with Abraham, it's just a concept. It's the spirit of God. It's the spirit. Now it doesn't say specifically that the spirit of God was in him, beside him. We're talking logistics now. Right? We're just talking logistics. But the emphasis and the ministry of the indwelling the Spirit of God is multiple. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you or forsake you. We can multiply statements like that uh, all the way through uh, the Old Testament. Uh, certainly the Emmanuel reaches its climax in the incarnation. But the virgin birth was not the beginning of the Emmanuel concept. Right from the very beginning. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. The aspect of the ministry of, that we associate with the indwelling of the Spirit. All the way through the Old Testament. What about the temple? What about the temple? What, 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 was, what was God teaching to me in the tabernacle? Now the tabernacle, right? We've got to get our hermeneutics. The tabernacle temple uh, was first of all a 
symbol, had many, many things involved with it, sacrifice, whatever. But the tabernacle, the dwelling, the, well, the mishkan, right? The mishkan, the dwelling place, the dwelling place of the Lord. It was a symbol, a symbol of that divine presence. An object lesson. A symbol was an object lesson that was given to the contemporary to teach them a spiritual truth. But people, we have to understand that the symbol was not the reality. The symbol was not the reality. It pointed to the reality. So the tabernacle, the mishkan, the dwelling place of God with his people, was an object lesson of what truth? God was living, God was dwelling with his people. The Ark of the Covenant, that great manifestation of the presence of God. God was not in that box. Right? God was not in the box. The box was an object lesson. It was a symbol of a spiritual reality. And whenever you confuse, whenever you confuse the symbol with the reality, you're going to be in trouble. It points to the reality. It points to the reality. Were there Israelites that thought God was in the box? Yeah. Let's take that into battle. We'll say this. Made it a talisman. But to confuse the symbol with the reality is always deleterious. This is the point. This is the point. So what was the reality? If the tabernacle was teaching that God was present with his people, and God was dwelling with his people. What was the reality? God was dwelling with his people. All right. God was dwelling with his people. Not in that tent. That's the object lesson. The object lesson is designed to point to the reality. You say, how did they figure that out? Because they weren't idiots. <laughs> we have the Lord's Supper. We have the Lord's Supper, and we see the symbols there. We see the bread. We see the wine. As symbolic. As symbolic of the reality of the body and the blood. Are there people who think that that's the, yeah? yeah. Transubstance, they think that's the real thing. But we know they're wrong. They're symbols. And if we confuse the symbol with the reality, we miss the point. Drastically, we miss the point. It's the same thing here. It takes us to the reality. So I say we put all that together. Time has gone here. But you put all that together with the, with, with the, with, 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 with the symbolism and the typology, with, with the express statements, I will be with you, the Emmanuel concept. There is plenty of evidence. Now, it's not specified, I'll grant you. It's not specified. That it's the person of the Spirit of God that is doing those things. Well, so, speaking with them. But by implication, and certainly by the ministry, it's the same as we have uh, for our understanding of the end of Okay, all right, time is up. We'll do something else next time. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we give our thanks for the Spirit of God that is available to us to enable us to serve and to fulfill the task that we have in the kingdom. And forgive us, Lord, for not availing ourselves and making ourselves submissive uh, to that amazing work of thy Holy Spirit. For it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirits of the Lord of hosts, of the work of the kingdom. So grant to us that power, Lord, in all that we do. Now bless these men as they continue their projects. Give them insight now in this book, Theologies. Uh, that it be a profitable study for them. Open up a whole gateway of further study that will do them good in their ministries ahead. Hear our prayers and bless us in Jesus' name.